I'm so happy to be baking with you today to learn something from you and something tells me it's going to be a lot more than one thing. Um, welcome to Bake Club. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. I am, I was like rushing around to make everything perfect. I picked flowers for this. Come on! Well, your Instagram <laughs> handle is at Small Orchids, and of the things that I know about you, the one thing that I don't know about you is is this part. So I love I love the sort of tie-in. You love you. I mean, you love many things, but talk to me about talk to me about the handle name, and talk to me about your love for flowers, planting perennials with your mother-in-law, and everything <laughs> in between. Yeah, so I, um, actually, it's my name translated into English. So my name means small, and my middle name is Orchidia, which means orchid. So I'm not as hipster as people think. I was just like, <laughs> so I was like, this is a great translation for my, like, handle. And now, like, folks are asking me, they're like, you should change your Instagram to, like, Chef Paula Velez. I'm like, how boring. No. I want to leave it small orchids forever. I mean, I love that. I didn't know that Paula translated to small. It means small and humble. I'm not really, I don't know if I'm humble. Isn't it like a, like a contradiction to say you're no, humble? No, I mean, I think humble is a state of mind and I think you have a ton of humility about mm. you on so many different levels. It means small and humble. Oh my God, I love that. There you go. There you go. <laughs> um, okay, Bay Club. Uh, a few quick things. This is Paula Velez. She's incredible. Of the many fun facts about her, um, she's from the Bronx, but is a pastry chef in Washington, D.C., and I like to sort of think about, I left the Virginia, D.C. area to go be a pastry chef in New York, so in some hilarious way, we have done this, like, trading spaces. <laughs> Someone will write, some, it'll, we'll star in our own film at some point. Um, she fun fact, was on the opening team of a Bakers and Pastry Chefs when Milk Bar opened in Washington, D.C. years ago. She had um, a foot-ankle situation, um, which may have at the moment seemed like this sadness and this goodbye, but instead, all good things happen for a reason. It pushed her to take some time off, and she has since become her own boss, a pastry chef on so many different levels. Most recently, a pastry chef at Kith and Kin, which is down on the waterfront in Washington, D.C. Um, she is a James Beard nominee for the Rising Star Chef Award, which I think is so incredible. She is off and on and beyond doing her own thing. Um, sometimes she makes donuts at Donia Donia, but you know her. Whether you think you know her or not, you know her most because she is one of the three founding members of Bakers Against Racism. And a Bake Club, I know you showed up big and ready to get your baking on, to help sell baked goods, to go out and buy baked goods, to consume baked goods. This is the Wonder Woman that has been connecting us through these past few months and much, much earlier before that. This is Paola Velez. So, ah! <laughs> uh, and by the I'm way, so I my Bakers Against Racism t-shirt, and I'm so excited for it to arrive, because I jones after it every time I see somebody else wear it. Oh, I'm so happy. Um, and I saw it on you and was like, ah! <laughs> um, how, uh, how are you? What are you up to these days? So now um, I'm no longer with Kith and Kin. I did transition to um, Maiden and Compass Rose here in D.C. Well, over there in DC since I'm in Long Island right now. But um, yeah, I'm kind of, I don't know, maybe I'm a little spooked because they have a Michelin star and I'm like, what does that mean? You know? That's what I'm talking about. This is like, you're like, I don't know if I'm humble. Girl, you're plenty humble. Um, and don't you worry about it. You bring the thunder with every single thing you do, mostly because you show up as yourself. And I think there is no greater way and no greater superpower as a human in the world, but specifically as a chef and a pastry chef. We need more individuality. We need more flavors that mean something to, to people as people um, to connect us all through. And that's why I'm excited to not just get to hang out with you today, but to bake with you. So Paula, what are you teaching us today? So I'm gonna teach you guys how to make a uh, chocolate mousse, but it's a different type of chocolate. It's one of my favorites uh, from Ralvona. It's called uh, Dulce, 
I can bring the bag over. I got you. I got you. Here we go. This beautiful stuff. Yeah, I like that we're both like <laughs> I um I love it because it, it reminds me of Dulce de Leche, which is very big in the Latinx community. Um, but it's just like a caramelized toasted white chocolate. Um, and they were like the first to do that. And I just kind of like wanted to do a dulce de leche mousse without having to go through the process of making dulce de leche. I don't want any uh, cans to explode in here. So, yes. <laughs> you know, so, so when, I, you're make, when you're making dulce de leche from scratch, by the way, um, dulce de leche is just like one of the greatest. It's like the deep milky caramel of right. all of your greens. Uh, you can you can buy it store bought because when I'm feeling lazy, I definitely go. La La Chera makes a really great um, little can of it. Yeah. Um, but it's basically taking sweet and condensed milk, you put it in like a pot. You have to cover the whole can with water, and then you cook it down. I've heard people cook it down for incredible lengths of time. You gotta make sure the water covers it, otherwise the can explodes. Yeah. And also, I feel like, so usually what I do in, in like regular, like, um, not home kitchens, but like industrial kitchens, I like sous vide it, you know? So. Yeah, we do the same at Milk Bar. We'll, we'll open like basically bake clubs. You can open sweetened condensed milk. You can put it in one of those like food saver bags that takes a lot of um, the air out of it. And you can, can basically like cook it in a water bath. Yeah. Um, un under pressure, sous vide is what Paula's talking about, which is another way to do it. I've never tried doing that at home. That would be a really fun one. But this is like the way forward. The, our sweet friends at Valrona <laughs> sent us both some Dulce, which I love that it's six pounds of it. Um, a little bit more than I might need today, but if, in case you can't tell, my bag's already open because <laughs> when it's five, I just started eating it. Which is a little it's so good. It's so snackable. I know. But, so yeah, so I'm making that mousse, that chocolate mousse. It's really easy and intuitive. Um, there's no like multiple oh. like steps. Well, a few steps, but it's not like crazy intuitive. And then I'm gonna make um, a crunch that is like an homage to you because ah! you know what you got like what you guys did when I went to when I first moved to DC was you gave me like a, a place to feel at home. Like I was really homesick. So when I was working, I just felt like um, like everything was gonna be okay, you know? Because I was just like, yeah. So, so yeah, so I wanted to do that to kind of like play into like both of my dueling worlds and what you were able to influence in my life, you know? So we're gonna make a um, cornflake crunch um, I'm going to use uh, unfrosted cornflakes, but you guys at home can use um, whatever cereal you choose, you know, it's going to be super fun and easy to like turn into crunchy things, but um, everyone loves crunchy things. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's going to be like really easy, really fun. And it's a great um, summer dessert. Um, I have some fruit here. I have like blueberries and then I have like uh, green Pluots, and then and then just regular pluots. So oh, um, yeah, it's like really basic. I'm I'm pretty basic, <laughs> but first of all, that's not it. Uh, we have basically bait club. Just in case you can't, did not pick up what Paolo was trying to self-deprecate on, we are making a dulce de leche white chocolate mousse with some delicious crunchies and some gorgeous fruit of the season. Uh, and I imagine with the mousse, which by the way, we have not made mousse before, so I am so excited for you to teach me and teach all of Bay Club your ways of moosing, um, that we could use any chocolate we want. I'm very into the Dulce um, from Valrona because to your point, it gives those caramel notes, but it could be like any chocolate that Bay Club might have at home, any cereal Bay Club might have at home, any fruit Bay Club might have at home. They just gotta right. think about the flavor story. Yeah. Exactly. Oh it's, my God. It's... <laughs> I love it. Okay. Where do we start? So, um, I actually forgot to set up one step, which is like cracking my egg yolk. Oh, so... I'm with you. I haven't done any of it. So I'm with you. <laughs> I'll crack away. <laughs> it's not the bottom. Bottom, bottom. Sorry. <laughs> no, no worries. 
And by the way, Big Club, this recipe is online. You can follow along. Okay, so, so we're separating egg white from egg yolk. Right. So I believe that we are going to do a um a one time one egg right i'm gonna do a one egg but that's just because i'm running low on eggs and <laughs> a one egg batch of mousse makes like four cups of mousse right yeah yeah it gives you um quite a lot because when you uh fold in the whipped cream it'll um kind of like double in size got it okay great all right, so we separated one uh, one egg white from the egg yolk, and the egg yolk is what we're after. Yes. You can save these. You can make like um, I let not ice cream meringues or uh, macaroons, but that's for another bake club. And probably totally. that's for another <laughs> bake club. Bake club, you all know what to do with your egg white. Do you have like six different answers to that question? <laughs> so. What I'm gonna do now is I have my cream, and right. I have eight ounces of cream. Got it. Which translates into one cup. Perfect. One cup of heavy cream in like a medium bottom, in medium bottom soft pan, uh, saucepan, and that's um, oh, you got it right there. Okay, perfect. Show me. I got you. So you just put in your cream, and then um, I like to add like a little bit of salt. I'm Ooh. using like pink Himalayan salt. I thought it was pretty cool, but. Ooh. I'm into that. It gives it a little, it gives it not just depth of flavor, but a little bit of edge. Yeah. And then, you know, if you guys don't have vanilla, you can do a little bit of vanilla bean, but you could also just like not do um, anything at all. The flavor will be there regardless. Got it. This is just to like prop up the flavor of whatever mousse or whatever flavored chocolate we we choose to mousse up. Yeah, I think like if folks at home are using like um, dark chocolate, I would even add a little bit of like chili. Like, um, Ooh. like yes, I'm and, very into that. Or coffee, right? Um, uh, that would like it won't taste exactly like coffee. It'll double down on that chocolate flavor. Got it. So I'm gonna turn on my um, pot to like medium high heat. I usually okay. like, I lose control of my pot sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I do too. I mean, every stove is different and then the way every pot holds heat is different. Okay, so this is our one cup of heavy cream, a pinch of salt, maybe some extract if we did extract or depending on what chocolate you're using if you're not using this sort of dulce de leche caramelized white chocolate to paula's point like get into your spice drawer get into your imagination think about what's going to give your mousse personality an edge super into that okay so we're bringing up our heavy cream our salt maybe a little bit of extract or spice if we were using spice would you recommend adding it here yeah, so you want to kind of like um, bloom that flavor. Um, when you are making a any type of ganache or any type of like flavored cream based um, desserts, you want to kind of like activate the flavors, right? So I boil and then I let sit a little bit. Like if I were using um, chamomile, I would almost like Got steep it. it like a tea. Got it. And then strain it and then reheat it up melt it over the chocolate, mix, cool, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> flavor infusion. Right. Because the it. more time that you give it to kind of like, I don't know, marinate? Yeah. Marinate, <laughs> keep, you infiltrate, know? hydrate, right. all those things. Right. And I feel like a lot of home bakers, because it's at home, they're, um, I don't want to say they're rushing, but it's, it's a waiting game. Like pastry really is a waiting game. Like everything is about like flavor development and making sure that you kind of like um, let the ingredients do their job. Um, but when you're at home, you're just like, 
I want to eat now, you know? So really I started, like, when do I finish? When do I finish and eat? That's definitely right. the way that I am at home. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. So it's like one of those things where, um, I kind of like let it do, uh, no, it's fine. I think we're okay. <laughs> she, oh, I'm sorry. My husband's behind no, me. Hi, <laughs> He says hello. <laughs> you gotta wonder what there he is. <laughs> You're one. So um, I have it at like a scald right now, yes. so you can kind of see it because it's like um, make like steaming, right? So yeah, it's I'm almost gonna... like a it's almost like a um film develops on top. Right. So what I did was I um I'm gonna stop it from cooking and I'm going to temper my eggs. So, dog. I got, I got butters in here. Like, what are you gonna be done? <laughs> so I add a little bit at a time because what what I'm doing here is making sure that the egg doesn't cook. If we were to add the um the egg to the cream, then it would um curdle, and you would have yes. like scrambled egg mousse, which I don't know if that's a bad thing. No, I'm just no. kidding. It's a bad thing. It's a bad thing. <laughs> you know, I don't want scrambled egg mousse. I want scrambled eggs in a different. So tempering the <laughs> sort of process of slowly pouring our scalded heavy cream that hasn't come up to a boil yet, but to, to these beautiful shots. If they're steam, is so now is gently heating it up. Okay, give it to me. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to um bring that back into the pot. So we have safely uh, incorporated the egg with the cream. And sometimes in uh, other recipes, there's um, like you would add like a bunch of sugar, glucose, but really I just want to like let the chocolate do all of the talking. So yes. I, I feel like in that respect, I'm a big purist. I try to make desserts with as little ingredients as possible so that I know exactly which flavors I'm focusing on. But like um, a lot of restraint to that, I think. Yeah. Very pure. Okay, so our egg yolk and our heavy cream, we poured some of our warm heavy cream in little batches into our egg yolk. We whisked it. It's back in our pot. Should we turn the heat on? Yeah. Excellent. So if you have a digital thermometer, um, you can, um, Kind of figure it out but once it starts to not boil so so to speak but once it starts to come back to a scald um you might be at uh 80 degrees celsius or what's that in fahrenheit well as my husband looks it up <laughs> i'll let you guys know um 81 degrees is 178 fahrenheit don't worry i have it in my notes it's not because i remember <laughs> Got it. And this is just to make sure that we're cooking the egg yolk to a safe temp and there will be like a thickness to it then. Right. 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 So I will say in this um, variation, what I'm making and what you're making, it, you're going to have gelatin in yours. Uh, and I'm not because I couldn't find any gelatin. Thanks, oh COVID. Lord, but, Lord. So if the home bakers don't have gelatin at home, they can increase their chocolate to two cups. Okay. Um, and then you would follow the same protocol, just uh, making sure that that extra. So see here, I kind of went into um, like I I finished my um temperature cook. And you can see, cause it kind of boiled a little bit. So now I just yep. kind of like pour it on top. Got it. And let's see, we're pouring, that's one, I'm pouring it over one cup of chopped chocolate cause I have gelatin. Yeah. One and a half, is it? Halved is one cup. I mean, honestly, it depends on, it's really the best way to do chocolate is by weight because yeah. if you're, Chips, chips, chips take up a different um, amount. If you're using chips, it's a cup of chips, but if you're using these big, beautiful um, discs, it's a cup and a half. Yeah, yeah. 
But we'll so, post Paola's recipe is it's seven ounces of chocolate total. So if you have yeah. a or or, uh, or can weigh, it's seven ounces is the magic number. Yeah. I okay. do. Um, I feel like a lot of uh, bakers and like pastry chefs, we just like live in the realm of metrics. Yes. Because like and like Celsius, like we just don't think about things until it's like, oh, what's that in American measurements again? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's also like we do it at work for a living and translating it off the clock is like, bah, to your point of like, steep the chili, let the, let the flavor develop, you know, that sort of thing is something you think about at work and maybe not. Okay, so if you're using gelatin, um, you can either use um, a half a tablespoon of powder gelatin or, um, or one and a half gelatin sheets. Um, uh, do you have a preference for how you bloom the gelatin and when you add it? So when I bloom the gelatin, I just kind of um, add it to the, um, like if you have a little bit of cream, a little extra cream, yeah. just add a little extra cream that's cold and that'll kind of like wake it up. And Got then it. you can um, add it to, uh, we actually should have added it to the cream, but... Oh, I Guess what? I have a little bit of cream left in my sweet little measuring cup. Everything's still warm. So if you're using the gelatin tech, my friends, you're gonna you're gonna bloom it in a little bit of your cold heavy cream. It's a half a tablespoon of powdered gelatin or one and a half sheets of gelatin. And then you'll know how gelatin works. You gotta wake it up to palace point in something cold. Ideally, it's already part of the recipe, like this heavy cream. And then we already have something warm, so we can dissolve it in too. Exactly. And Wait. with the uh, sheets, I do suggest like folks kind of dunking it in cold water, ice water if your house is hot, um, and that will wake up that jet like the gelatin sheets. And then you could just add that straight to the cream, um, and it'll dissolve because the heat kind of just like melts it which is why you have to have like the cold ice water. Perfect. So I have my like gelatin, oh my gelatin, my non-gelatin uh, ganache here. And it's like super silky, it's like velvety. Um, I actually made some last night. Ooh. And this is what, what it looks like um, once it sets. Wow. Could you use that, Paola, for like, I don't know, a cake filling or yeah. pickles or does this work? Does this base of the mousse work in other, uh, I guess, applications? Absolutely. I mean, imagine just using this with a delicious flaky pie crust and filling it. Oh, oh, excuse me. <laughs> Please tell me when that is available at a bake sale. <laughs> I would be there with bells on. Or imagine making like a like sourdough discard pancakes and then just putting a dollop of this right on top. <laughs> okay, here is the question that I've been dying to ask you, and I like can't hold it in any longer. I think about um, like when I opened Milk Bar, it was kind of like. I don't know that I would have done it if I knew all the things that I know now, <laughs> not because I regret a moment of it, but I would have said to myself, oh my God, you don't know enough yet. You're not ready, blah, blah, blah. And like the thing that I always wonder in you is like, how did you, aside, how did you find your voice as a pastry chef? Cause this, there's this transition of like, you gain experience by working from others, by learning from others, by taking good and bad, right? Like there's lessons in all of it. And then at some point, you, you're, you're doing it in service of somebody else's vision. Yeah. And then and you make this transition to say like, I'm the boss, here's what it's about. I, I know that I like simple ingredients. I know that I don't want to like complicate or like muck up the waters with too many ingredients. I know I like edible, like how did that transition happen for you and work for you? Well, I think um, a big portion of that was 
working with good bosses, right? Mm. Like you were a very good boss. Jacques Torres was a very good boss, you know, and you guys didn't have like this mentality of uh, like, I am the one that's ruling supreme. You guys were like, we're a team. We're in this together. Your ideas are just as important as my ideas, you know? Mm -hmm. And like, I remember like knowing that I was going to get nominated for hard body. And I was like, oh, I'm a hard body. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know? And like, by the way, uh, this is like in a little inside baseball at Milk Bar every month. You get nominated. We give out an award by kitchen by department whatever it is hard body of the month and it's an award that you can win and you get nominated by your peers and it's about anything and everything it's not just about how great you mix the birthday cake or make bagel bombs it's about like the spirit that you bring in how you help people how you show up how you help the porter scrub the floors like it can be any it could be how you help someone get to work it could be anything that's what being like a hard body is about. I love that. So you felt feel like you were validated along early enough that you, you knew you had it in you. Yeah, basically. Right. So it, it takes a, a, a very big, um, like leap of faith to leave. Um, I was very comfortable being like a pastry sous and being like a helper, you know, um, because I'm really good at following directions and there's nothing wrong with not wanting to take the next step or not have your own business or not do these things. There's nothing wrong with being good at what you do and then going home and then relaxing, you know? Yeah. Um, but I just kind of figured, I was like, you know, I'm, I think, what was it? It was like four years ago, five years ago, five years ago, Hector. Yeah. <laughs> five years ago when I was like, I'm almost 30 and I need to like try. I just need to try. Mm. If I don't succeed, then I can like tell my children I tried to do something that I, I wanted to do since I started in this industry, you know? And yeah. if it didn't work out, then I could say I tried my, my absolute best and, but I would still be really good at my job. I would still be really good at, at following directions and making somebody else's vision come to life, you know? Yeah. But yeah. once, so, um, no one yeah. me that. I'm, I, I would not have been able to put it into words like you, but I love working for other people. I mean, there were, I had other jobs, you know, I had certain jobs that I learned a lot about what wasn't the right fit, but I learned yeah. and I loved working for other people, like in service of other people. And I think yeah. that is a spirit that resonates with most people in the industry. Like you're not working here to get like, it, any of the like visible or financial gain it's it doesn't exist here <laughs> no no uh so you have to have something deeper in you that you know yeah. okay so four years ago you sort of said i need to try yeah yeah and um it wasn't easy i will say that like transitioning from being um like a cook into being a chef wasn't like very as easy as submitting an application right i probably applied to 100 jobs and i only got one right are you being serious yeah you know and and i won't say why maybe they didn't choose me but i know that one of them did tell me i just didn't have the look you know i didn't look like a pastry chef and i was like i don't know what we're supposed to look like <laughs> you know it's like, yeah, were you, was your pastry coat not, like, crisp enough? Were you not I thought, enough? I thought it was. I pressed it. I, I was very, like, you know, cream and proper. I was like, hello. Hi, I'm Paula Velez. Hello. And I want to be a um, pastry chef. Thank you. You know? Um, but I, I finally, like, realized, I was like, if I keep on trying to conform to the systems that were of old, right? Like, what you were able to do was you were able to, like, break open that mold and like that cookie cutter perfect like french style pastry chef like was blown out of the water when you came into the industry and everybody was like milk bar you know and like i remember being in new york and everybody was like have you tried well i guess you guys call it milk bar pie now but i know yeah <laughs> but yeah you know it was like 
like it was spreading through all of New York City like wildfire, you know? And we as like up and coming pastry chefs, we were like, oh dude, my God, you know? <laughs> and um, I realized, I was like, if I don't act like myself, no one will hire me, mm-hmm. you know? Like, so I went to my like first pastry chef job um, and that's not saying that I wasn't a pastry chef. I was a pastry sous chef, but I was under someone. Yeah. But I went to my first pastry chef job um, officially, and I I was in the interview, and, like, he was like, Chef Tony was like, yeah, you know, why do you want to be a pastry chef? You know, we were going through the motions, and I, I stopped the interview, and I was like, please, I've done this so many times in the last year. I'm so tired. Can you just look at my portfolio and just, like, look at what I can do, you know? And he's like, sure. And I like, actually, my portfolio was on Instagram at the time. And I like led him to my Instagram. And he scrolled and he was scrolling and scrolling. And I'm sitting there like, uh, maybe I'm I about being silently judged. <laughs> <laughs> and then he's like, when can you start? So he didn't, he didn't judge my outward appearance. He didn't care what school I went to. He didn't care what jobs I had prior to that, which we're good jobs, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. and he was just also, like, you never get to see the pastry chef at a restaurant anyway. So why does it matter? <laughs> right. Right. And I, so I, I kind of took that like bold leap of faith and I was like, can you just look at my work? Like, forget about whatever you're seeing, forget about everything that I present and just look at what I have to offer. And he was like, oh my God, (laughs) you know? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I can do that at your restaurant, you know? And I did, you know? And then it was just like a whirlwind from there. But I feel like my biggest thing as I'd mentor a lot of uh, pastry chefs now is um, just be yourself, keep your head high, right? Because this industry is full of ups and downs, but, never change who you are you know like yeah. never change well, who, you, who are. you are is the single is the single thing that you have that differentiates you from every other person in like the most beautiful magnificent way and it's like why do we miss that why do we let others miss it why do we sometimes miss it <laughs> and why is it such a you know a, a challenging thing to like come full circle in the understanding. But it's it's exactly what you were able to do, right? Back yeah. when everybody I, else was doing I was, yeah, mine was like, I knew, I had worked so many different jobs in the kitchen, in the front of house, in the back of house for different chefs. I had tried on all these different, like other adjacency jobs on precise food styling, catering, um, food writing, right? And I just, my heart kept coming back to the pastry kitchen, but something about it still felt mismatched. And I was yeah. like, these pastry kitchens are not, they, they're the closest thing that feel like home, but I still feel like I'm a visitor. And like, I want to be able to wear tie-dye to work. And I don't want to, I don't want to wear it under my chef coat. And I want the, and I, kn- I knew that like, I wanted to do things like make cookies and pie and cake and soft serve and mine was like when that doesn't exist in the world and you know what it is what it is that you like to do what happens when you know what you want to do and you know that it doesn't exist in the world and it's it's very similar it's like you you say to yourself well I have to at least try to create it yeah because I believe that it should exist and I don't see it anywhere and I can't be afraid of the fact that because it doesn't exist doesn't mean it shouldn't exist. Right. And I mean, like, imagine we, we all knew of like, you know, Dairy Queen and we all knew (laughs) of like, you know, like very classic Americana desserts, but like you, not only did you update it, but then you flipped it and then you like reversed it and presented it in a way that modernized our Mm -hmm. culinary scene, Mm -hmm. you know, for desserts. You know, and that kind of boldness is the same boldness that I keep telling people, you know, to enact, you know, like, wh- like, again, what do we have to lose more than somebody being like, I don't like that. And then we're like, okay, let's try something else, you know, um, totally. but, <laughs> but the chance is that most people are going to be like, wow, I've never seen this before. I really do like it. And you might change somebody's life. Like you enacting in your 
like truth and in what you wanted to present to the world inspired me, you know, okay. which and then in turn, like inspired so many other people behind me, you know, and it's a trickle effect of good, you know, I feel like when you put in good into the world, you always will have it come back full circle, which is why we're yeah. here together now. It you is. Know? I mean, it is. I, when I was talking to you on the phone a few weeks ago, I was like, almost tearing up. I was like, she might think I'm crazy, <laughs> but you have, you have taught me so much and you have, an, you have inspired me so much. And by the way, it's not lost on me that it's not just me. It's so many other people who, I mean, my reality was, um, just before, um, you and, um, Robin Willis started Bakers Against Racism, I, I, my reality was like, I felt so lost and I felt um, like someone who typically says, like, get up, let's go, let's do something about it, let's this, let's that. Um, I just felt stalled in, in a bunch of different ways. And you gave me, uh, you reminded me and gave me a path forward. And it's not just me, it's, I mean, you, the first Bakers Against Racism bake sale sort of week raised over $2 million to a bunch of different chapters to Black, uh, Black Lives Matter, to ACLU, to EJI, to um, charities, nonprofits, uh, that, that a whole bunch of different people that hosted these bake sales chose and donated to. You reminded the world of the power of goodness and of a baked good and of like, true humble time spent in a home kitchen or with opening up your pocketbook in front of someone and saying i'm he like i'm i'm here to support through this cookie or this tart i mean i i can't really put it into words because it goes so much deeper than that but i love um you have you have been a fountain of inspiration on so many different levels Thank and you. have breathed like new life into me and to so many others uh, because of you, just because of you being who you are and doing things and being, um, using, like, being loud enough to be like, can you just look at my work? We're gonna, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, let's just cut to the, let's cut to the cussing chase about it. You know what I mean? And let's get yeah. to work sort of thing. Can we please just get into the kitchen? And that's what I love about it. Okay, tell me, I have my dulce ganache made, and I'm 100% saving some of this for pancakes uh, <laughs> and for a tart. And then I have some heavy cream to the side that we're whipping. Yeah, but I think we should make our uh, cornflake crunchies first so that stays in the um, oven while we whip everything. Perfect. Okay, so cereal crunchies. Rules, your rules are bring a cereal that, that's going to go with the mousse and the fresh fruit. Yes. So I have, um, so I kind of measured out uh, a cup of sugar, um, but I don't know if we need all of that. Okay. I have uh, like two cups here of cornflakes. What I like best about your cornflake crunchies recipe is, is like, it's kind of intuitive, which kind of is the way that I, when I, when I R&D something, I don't really use measuring cups. I like make the thing that tastes delicious and then I go, okay, that's where I need to get before I start measuring. <laughs> it's, it's like baking doesn't have to be an absolute science, you know what I mean? It could just be fun, you know? And that's what I, I tell all of like the cooks that come and work with me now. It's like that, um kind of like flexibility relaxes them, right? To have some recipes that are like, you must do it this way or else we will never leave this kitchen. But also some that are like, put a little fruit in there, put a little sugar, a little water, and now we have sorbet, you know? And they're like- That's happy. Yeah, so. Okay, talk to me. So I have cornflakes and some sugar in a bowl. Yes, so I have cornflakes, some sugar. I don't think I'll need all of my sugar. Um, so we have, I had a, I added a little bit of cinnamon to the sugar 
just because I like cinnamon and it's like very, um, it reminds me of like the Dominican Republic, which is where I'm from. Right. And um, we use a lot of spices in that way. Mm. Oh, okay. I thought I froze. I was like, oh. Oh, no, no, you're good. good. I'm just, I'm, li I'm like listening. You, you so, use a lot of spices to sort of like enhance a basic pantry ingredient like cornflakes? Well, not really. So we um, kind of use these ingredients like it's clove, nutmeg, and cinnamon. And these mm. are like base ingredients for uh, the Dominican Republic when we make anything, right? Um, especially when we preserve fruit, you always will find clove and cinnamon in there, you know? So I added a little bit, and what I'm doing is I'm sprinkling it on to the dry cornflakes. Got it. Um, and then I'm kind of like tossing it. Yes. To kind of like bring everything to the bottom. Got and it. Now I have um, some butter. I melted like half a stick of butter. Okay. I almost made a mess. <laughs> anyway. Melted and, butter. Um, I just pour a little bit. And then I kind of like move it around and I see how much more I need, right? Got it. The and butter that, butter will actually be, that butter is meant to be like the glue for the sugar and the cinnamon. Right. Got it. So and did you put salt in a pinch? I I don't remember, but I did put I made some last night. Oh, okay, good. So it's kind of up to like depending on what cereal you're gonna use. You can zhuzh it. I love the idea of a little bit of cinnamon. That cinnamon and leche feels like a very, very, very brilliant flavor comfort bridge. Yeah. And so you're kind of like tossing and tasting your melted butter, sugar, cinnamon, salt mixture, and you can kind of add as you go. It sounds yeah. Like. So as I was, um, as I was like mixing it, I looked at the bottom of my pot and or pan bowl <laughs> and <laughs> and I saw that I put too much butter right so I didn't use all of my sugar so I'm gonna put the rest of my sugar in there and that's why when I say um it's kind of intuitive you yeah. you kind of can like mess around with it like it's not a um like a oopsie I call these like fun mistakes and sometimes fun mistakes make it on the menu so totally I love so now that, that so the, the crunchies would get like coated, you know, in this like butter sugar mixture. And that's what's going to make it um, like crispy crunchy. So I have yes, a sheet. Can I just for a moment say, I think you have created a brilliant new cereal right here, which is kind of like a buttery frosted flake with cinnamon. It's kind of like if Cinnamon Toast Crunch and Frosted Flakes had a love child, it would be what's in <laughs> And I'm it's very really good. happy I can't stop about eating. it. Very I happy have, about it. This is I very to hide it because we were all eating it last night. We were like, what is this? This is very brilliant. Fake Club, you need to make like the biggest batch of this crunchy situation possible. Okay. So we just put that on a sheet pan? Yeah, and then we kind of give it some space, some um, room to breathe. If you can see on my uh, pan here, I kind of totally. just like, like spread them apart. But it, what I love about this is like, it doesn't clump up because we didn't use so much um, butter. They yeah. naturally will separate now. So all we're doing Got is it. like crunching it back up. It's Got not it. dehydrating it, but it's just like, Letting the butter do butter things, you know? Yeah, a hundred percent. Okay, in the oven, what oven, what temp is our oven at? Oh, 325. Yes, we have it at 325. And I'm just gonna um leave it doing its like its thing. You kind of like let it do its magic because it depends on like the moisture. Like right now, Long Island is really like sticky and warm. So yeah. it just you kind of have to like let it do its thing. You'll see it because, like, it'll stop being translucent. Got and it. It'll, so it'll, like... it'll caramelize and um, sort of uh, get a new shell of itself in the oven. Oh, there we yeah. go. It'll get, like, it. um, frosted flaky. 
Uh, I would like to submit for consideration that there is a Bakers Against Racism cereal that <laughs> one of the big cereal companies makes, and it is these crunchies because I'm, I am going to save some of them for this dessert, but I will be also saving some of them for a bowl with just milk. Or it's, maybe it's like a little bit of like a dulce de leche milk situation. Mm. Mm. Okay, what's next, my friend? Um, so now what we're going to do is, hmm, I have some whipped cream pre-made, but that was for something else. I made like this, um, banana, I made this like banana, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> this, uh, saffron tamarind banana pudding today. Tamarind, ooh, you're speaking yeah. my Tamarind banana and saffron, it must be just a beautiful color. Yeah, it was, um, let me see, I guess it's like yellowish, it's like a yellow tint. The saffron is like doing its thing overnight. So I actually, I'll send you a picture. Um, I would like a picture, please. When I, when I uh, post it online, maybe I'll put the hashtag bake club so that okay, the bake club yeah, can no, see it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so... I you come on, we're making that next time. <laughs> yeah. no, so wait, are yeah, you just r and ding that flavor? Yeah. So what I did, instead of vanilla wafers, I made um, like a crispy uh, phyllo, uh, sugar phyllo that I broke apart and I layered in between so oh. that it like did the same thing as vanilla wafers, but it was very like Middle Eastern, kind of like Lebanese banana pudding. So, okay, I have a question now because it's clear to me that there is something in this. You love the cream, like you love creamy. Creamy is clearly, I mean, I've had your desserts before, but you, you your brain, when you think about vehicle for flavor, one of the places you go is creamy based on yeah. this dulce mousse and this banana saffron tamarind pudding. Yeah. So why is that? Why is that a, like a, a thing for you? I'm curious. Is that like a childhood dessert that you loved or? I think, I feel like people find comfort in creamy things, right? Um, and I just want people to have like a moment of their day where they forget everything that's going on in the world. And they just kind of like think about like all the textures, all the flavors, everything that's happening in their mouth. And they have a moment of rest, you know? I feel like pastry chefs, that's what we do. We just provide people with a moment of like escape and joy, you know? So with like everything that I make, it's like, there's so much just like creaminess kind of like coats your mouth and like gives you like this hug, you know? Same warm thing with hug. like warm desserts, you know? And like, I, I combine warm and creamy together to make like this like oasis that we kind of like can like leave. That's it is, though, right? It's an oasis. It's like a comfort blanket and an oasis. If those two things could be one, they are Paolo Velez's dessert. That's for sure. <laughs> All right, let me see if I can figure out the handle. So I'm gonna um, mix it with the mixer over here, but I can still okay. hear you. Okay, good. Oh, all right, I'm having techn my technical difficulties. My long, crazy arm. So I didn't, um, I didn't add any um, sugar or sweeteners to this because I don't want to um, like mess up the levels of the dulce. Got it. So this is just three quarters cup of heavy cream, whipping to what? What would you say? Like a soft medium peak. I do like a medium, almost hard, but not too, like, it can't go like too hard, but it, it has to be like a medium hard peak. Got it. So medium because it needs enough body to be able to play with your dulce ganache, but you right. don't want to go so hard because you know you're still going to be mixing it because we have to make the two come together. Right. Exactly. Got it. Got it, got it, got it. My crunchies are smelling really good in the oven. Too, by the 
That's nice, right? <laughs> it can hold its shape without wilting over. That's it. That's it. Okay, so Paula, while you whip, what is going on with Bakers Against Racism? What are you working on now? What's next? How are you thinking about things? So Bakers Against Racism right now, we are, um, we are hosting like micro grants with um, Bee's Grocery Fund. One of the bakers that participated in the bake sale, she had um, extra funds that she wanted to turn into um, like grants for essential workers. So we're um, now we're fundraising and we're giving uh, bakers in the baker community um, an option, another option for their donations to go to. You know, amazing. So and what is the name of this? What's the name of the grocery fund? Bee's Grocery Fund. Like um, the pastry chef is Chef Cassidy Lewis, and she has a, a small bakery that's called Bumblebee Pastry, and. Um, her grandmother's uh, favorite animal or insect is bees. So Got it. she named it after um, her grandmother because when she had um, a tough time in, or in the community, you know, she would make these like funds for other people in the community to be able to like access. That's incredible. So BEE apostrophe S grocery fund. We yeah. will make sure that um, uh, when everyone sees this video, that there's a link to it so that you can go and donate. And it's $50 uh, for a grocery fund per essential worker. So for every $50 you donate, it goes to an essential worker for a, gro for a grocery fund for them so that they can take care of themselves while they care for all of us. Right. Um, oh, where's my chicken? <laughs> I love it. Your my brain is getting jealous. It needs. It feels like it needs to be down to here. And it's always <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, also, within the Baker's community, we are hosting um, a partnership with a big sugar company that's sustainable. I won't name them yet, okay. um, just so that it's not like a thing, <laughs> you know. But. Yes. Um, but they are going to help us make more micro grants to help um, chefs of color be able to access um, these funds to help them, whether it's to buy a laptop to make their online business or to just be able to like pay their rent for a month or two months and they're able to like do a stagiaire somewhere so they can learn more, you know? So. Awesome. The Baker community is like shifting from just being like a means of uh, knowledge and like knowing where to donate to a place where we're going to be able to directly affect the Baker community itself, you know, and then we're going to be hosting another bake sale in, at the end of the year. So we will be there. We will be. I mean, we're going to be at bees. We're going to be many places, but you know when it's bake sale time. Right. We'll we're just gonna bring this. We're gonna, I'm gonna bring these these cinnamon cornflake crunchies for sure. I might drink all this mousse, but <laughs> <laughs> so and you think um, that'll be at the end of the year? Yeah, yeah, the holiday season. But we have to kind of figure out like where's the perfect date so we can include all the holiday seasons at once. Yeah. So yeah, so we just kind of gotta stay tuned, I guess. Got it. I love it. <laughs> Just keep us so, just keep us wondering keep us following okay so my this what i also love about this dulce ganache is it almost looks like straight up dulce de leche that's just a right. little bit bigger. right so um with this we are going to kind of like fold in like aggressively some of this um whipped cream Got it. So we're, we're sacrificing, what would you say this is, a, a third of it, a fourth of the whipped cream? Yeah, like maybe a third. Got it. And that kind of gives you um, more leverage. It's easier when uh, it's made um, same day, right? Because it's it. easier to like mix and, but like when you like let it refrigerate overnight, it sets up right? So yeah. I have to be a lot more aggressive <laughs> to kind of get everything incorporated. But yeah. it should turn into like this pale color. 
and it should be a lot like looser. So then I, I do kind of put it in batches and I fold. So when you fold, you kind of got to like go under and over, under and over at the side. Like it's like you're uh, scraping the side of the bowl. Got and it. Almost, this one, you're almost like you are gently suggesting without actually being, um, like you're not being direct about like, you two get together, you're going like, hey, it would be super nice. What about, what about, what about? It's kind of like right. if your spatula had a tone of voice. <laughs> <laughs> right. And the, like, the good thing about this is you can make it in advance. And um, especially like if you were going to like make something molded, Right. Um, I think you could go a lot more aggressive to really take out all of those air bubbles so Got that it. when you pour it into your molds, it doesn't, um, what's the word I want to use? It doesn't, um, it's not flimsy, you know, like structure. Yeah. Like, like it's not like uh, bubbly and like it'll, it won't break. Right. When you're demolding it. Is that a word? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm picking up what you're putting down. <laughs> this is incredible. How do you typically, like if you're at home, how do you typically serve this? So if I'm at home, I would wait um, a few hours before I serve it. Oops, sorry. And um, I would kind of like, serve it like rustic, very right? um, free form. I wouldn't like make it into like this, like, you can serve it in like a pie dish. You could put it all like together. You can layer your berries. Um, you can macerate your berries and put it on top. It's not uh, to be like, I don't know, intense, right? It's mm -hmm. just like a, an easy, like, cold dessert that you can have in your fridge if you're gonna have a socially distant barbecue or something. I love that. Could you do like individual, like put yeah. some now into individual, I don't know, like cups or glasses or bowls. Yeah. Let, let you, we would then let it set in the fridge over an hour or two. And then before we served it, crunchies and fruit macerated or otherwise. Yeah, um, I think you could like definitely put it in individual, even like mason jars, you know, that would be really oh, cool to like layer it, but I wouldn't add the crunchies until you're ready to serve because the crunchies will um, get soggy with the moisture. But and they're crunchies, so by nature, they have to be crunchy. You want to serve them crunchy and you want them to stay crunchy. Right. Ooh. I love that. Do you think that this um, mousse would freeze? Like, would you ever serve it frozen? Yeah, so I do, um, whenever I wanna like, um, especially make mousse at the restaurant in advance, I would freeze them into molds and then we would like leave them frozen out of the mold. And then when we were ready to serve it, we would take it out, leave it in the refrigerator and it would come back to temperature. You just have really? to have something that's like, um, like a, what's a word I want to use? Like something that's like chocolate based that won't get soggy when um, you like put it onto the mold when you're defrosting it, right? Because it'll like get totally. like wet, right? Totally. That's what I want to add. Like, I don't know if I'm saying it right. No, no, you are. So, all right. So what you're saying, Bay Club, is if you have little molds that you, um, they, like, if you want to serve this mousse, we'll call it freeform, so not in, like, a mason jar or a glass or in a bowl, but where it stands on its own, Pal is telling us that we can take molds that can be, they can be metal molds. They could also be, like, silicone um, ice cube molds. Yeah. Where you fill um, in, in silicone, like, ice cube tray form, you'd fill, you'd freeze. While they're still rock hard, you'd pop them out. But the, in this form, you would just take this out frozen, put it on the plate that you were going to serve it at, let it defrost, and then you could just go shook. Right. You could also use this to, like, fill cakes, right? 
um, to, if you were to do it with like parchment paper, you would like put the parchment paper around the mold, the ring mold, and like put your cake and then like fill up. This is how I make like this vegan cake. Um, I have like this vegan chocolate cake. Then I like have this acetate and then I like fill it up with vegan chocolate mousse. I freeze it. I take off the acetate and then I pour vegan ganache over it. That's when you're like, I would like it to accidentally be vegan today, please. <laughs> I would still like this mousse, but I would also like it with your vegan chocolate cake and your vegan Ugh, It's that's really good. That's I, I think so. I don't know. <laughs> okay, show me, show me this plating situation. So I have my mousse, and what I do is I kind of like level it out. It has like almost like a canvas. Mm-hmm. And oh, so um, I actually should have cut this beforehand, but I'm going to do it here. Oh, yeah, cut slide. it. I got you. I'm going to get some glasses to put my situation in. I'm going to try a few different ideas on both sides. This, I actually think, this is the thing I miss most about working in restaurants because we don't really plate anything at the bakery. It's all meant to be like a quick grab and go. Yeah. And this idea of, of playing around with how you present your, your, you know, your masterpiece, your flavor story, whatever it is, is a really fun one. Try to put as many crunchies without it being like overbearing, because I like the crunchies. Um, sometimes what I, I let like the um, like servers know is that if a customer is like, oh, this is so good, but it's not enough crunchies. Um, they could always ask for more. Totally. Cause, because I'm, I'm telling you from having snacks on all of my crunchies while I was just captivated by your plating, uh, is there's never gonna be enough crunchies. That's just the there's reality. Enough. So now, um, this is what my plate looks like. Okay, this is what mine looks like. <laughs> <laughs> that is freaking gorgeous, Paula. Um, okay, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for teaching us so much under the guise of teaching us the Dulce Moose. Um, we, uh, I'm just a bit speechless, both in the beauty of that plated dessert and how quickly it came together. Um, we learned about the most delicious uh, caramelized white chocolate, um, chocolate called Dulce. Um, we learned how to make a mousse. We learned how to make a ganache first. We learned how to make the next best thing uh, on the grocery aisles of the cereal, the cereal <laughs> aisle of the grocery stores, this cinnamon coated uh, frosted flake for all intents and purposes. We learned <laughs> about this gorgeous, amazing human. The, your sense of comfort and, um, consistency in yourself is incredibly inspiring, I have to say. <laughs> and beyond being an, an award-winning um, top of her game pastry chef, you are just an incredible human being that it's clear shows up for so many different people in so many different ways. And you will not stop until we continue day in and day out to find a way to do better and to support one another better. And, and, and to find this sort of comfort blanket meets oasis in the work that we do through desserts, um, but also in the power that those desserts can yield beyond an emotional feeling in, in doing good and in being good. Bake Club, you better get your ovens turned on for later this year when Bakers Against Racism hosts another bake sale nationwide, worldwide. And check out V's Grocery Fund in the meantime. Put your dollars to work. Help support the essential care workers that support us, our families, our loved ones, day in and day out. They need our love and they need our support. Thank Paula, you. thank you so much for teaching us so many things. <laughs> uh, my tiny, humble orchid of a friend, you are just incredible. I am so grateful for you. Uh, I am rushing this off to the refrigerator mostly because I'm in my at-home mode and something tells me I won't be able to wait two hours before I eat this mousse. <laughs> But I will be just giving you a warm hug like this all along the way. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you for having me. I was like eating. Wait, what do like, we do with this? Wait, what is the heart? You make my elbows make it into a really awkward heart. There you go. <laughs>
You're the best, Mama. I'll talk to you soon. Okay, bye. Thank you.